Hello, I am uh, Riyad Ben Osman, and I would like to thank first everybody for inviting me to give this talk. Um, so I'll be speaking about uh, event computer vision, which is why we're here today, and trying to assess what happened over the 10 years I've been around in this field for I don't know, 15, 16 years now. And so the idea is um, for many people who joined recently and those who are here along the way with us and those who were here from the beginning even before me. I think uh, I'll try to say to explain in 20 minutes where we came from, where we are right now and uh, where we are heading to. So it's important to to know that uh, um, event cameras uh, come from uh, uh, an effort community, uh, that of a neuromorphic community. I meet since the 90s in this place called uh, Telluride initially where uh, it was a uh, really few people there uh, trying to think and among those uh, were Misha Mahal that we see here seen by her own device camera that uh, she did back then which I think started the whole field and it was um, quite a frame based camera actually with a certain se center surround um, center surround uh, of a mechanism from the retina and that led to the start of it. It's um, neuromorphs are around now for at least 30 years and it's really nice to see that the field has taken off. So the promise is to from day one to gather I would say uh, what we would call now a translational team to understand brains and try to figure out what can we do from our understanding of brains to come up with new computers, new sensors if you're really interested in this, there's um, a book that Toby once gave me a long time ago uh, called uh, The Silicon Eye that traces back the story of how this started in Caltech between uh, Nobel Prizes uh, and how Carver Mead started uh, his work on trying to think uh, of new ways of acquiring information and copying in nature and in, in silicon. So. All in all, what's really important is today this is an engineering conference, but event cameras um, and e neuromorphic in general gives us the opportunity to to think of computer vision as uh, not an engineering, but really more like a basic science if one makes the effort. So what do I intend by basic science? Well, you know, you can observe the world and make statistics out of it, say this is how the moon shows up, this is how the star goes, but you don't have a deep knowledge of it. You can have good statistical approaches of it. And to move forward and to go really in what makes a science is you need something to observe. In this case, I'm giving the example of you know um, um, uh, the course of planets. So you need to build tools and then observe, infer what's happening, try to understand based on the data. And once you have the data and you think you have a good understanding of what's happening, you can write a model out of it, and that model gives you a very deep explanation that allows you to develop space travel, um, communication, because you're asking one more question about. In our case, and I think it's the case of most neuromorphs, we do, at least myself and I know many other people too, try to replicate that scheme, which is not only focus on math, and I come from computer vision and robotics, but trying to do it that way, which is try to understand or record from eyes and brains, then infer, try to understand how those work, because to this day nobody competes with these. And then once you understand, as I showed, you build models and then you build hardware and you have the possibility to, to act on your world and to have an impact. And in our case, the promise is huge because uh, event cameras are great and all sorts of event-driven technologies are great for robotics, for looping back to the brain uh, and restoring sight and speaking to the brain, uh, for very fast uh, robotics. You can also think of new machine learning. To this day, what we call machine learning is really a very crude um, interpretation of what the brain is doing. So. It's really nice and it's like in any basic science, you can go from data and, and go up, which is a, a feed forward approach and, and then you can do a, a bottom up and then you can go from the top and make
prediction based on the math and the models and see if what you think uh, should happen with events is what the brain is really doing. So you can go wrong and in the end it makes our life even easier because the best methods are those who will match the data. Okay, so still where we came from, people focused a lot on replicating portion of the brain in the neuromorphic uh, community, really portion of the cortex. But perhaps the one that may it take off is the retina. And why is that? It's because the retina is the most approachable portion of the brain. You can take a piece of retina, put it in this dish where you have electrodes. You can shine movies. This is m my setup. Uh, and, and, and uh, uh, no, actually, this is not my setup. <laughs> and uh, you can record the, the, no, the electric activity of neurons. And it's very similar to what events uh, d driven cameras are doing. But to be fully honest with you, because I've worked a lot on retinas and recording from retinas, the biological retina is still far, far ahead what we're doing in event driven um, cameras right now. It's from a perspective of power, from a perspective of uh, uh, dynamic range, from uh, operational, uh, honestly, uh, precise timing. The biological retina is, is a wonderful machine. And to this day, just for you to understand, there is no model that really encapsulates everything that that piece of brain is doing. So event-based camera is a long story. Um, of course, I spoke about Misha's work. But then there were quite uh, many cameras that were built, uh, one from Corbena. I don't remember the name, but uh, you have a very nice TED talk about it. And then you had the octopus camera. And the one we know today uh, comes from the work of uh, York uh, Kramer, who, who passed away. And, and it was inside the European project that Toby took uh, and, and, and accomplished when he finished. And that will give rise to the DVS, uh, where Patrick, Toby, and Christoph tried to do it together. And this is how the field started. And then you have many extension. Uh, I'm thinking of the artist that spun out of my lab. Uh, it was done by Daniel Matelin and Christophe, which is an evolution. And of course, there are many, many that come after that. But let's say that the original stream was to copy as much as possible what we know of the brain. And as you see, the more we go, time passes by, the engineering side takes over, and, and uh, we tend to build uh, better things and, uh, you know, probably not exactly what the retina is doing, but sufficiently uh, usable to, to bring the field uh, up and, and uh, all of us were quite on our own for many, I would say decades, many time. And now seeing all of you here, seeing a workshop organized in CVPR is really, is really rewarding for all these people who are pushing this field from day one. So today, uh, and it's very surprising, uh, I think uh, event cameras are becoming a commodity. Uh, everybody, every major company in the world has, uh, I mean, building and selling cameras has its event-based camera. And almost every startup that was uh, created from uh, an academic lab has been bought. So I think this is going to get better and better, hopefully. But it's good because for the layman now, anybody can buy um, a DVS or any sorts of camera or Davis and, and start playing with it. There are tools, there are papers, and it's less, I mean, you don't start from scratch. Um, so what's event acquisition? I think all of you understand that and know that by now. So this idea is to replicate what's happening at the periphery of the brain, where you like to signal um, changes as fast as possible. And so, unlike what we're taught as engineers, here you don't sample on the time axis, but the amplitude axis, and there is many ways to do it. The way that is now dominating the field is to do the relative change of, of light. And that gives you these waypoints that tell you exactly when the signal has changed by a significant amount. The most uh, interesting space for us, computer vision, people is this is XY. This is the camera that spun out of my lab. This is the ATIS, which is the DVS plus gray levels. And so you see at time XY, everything is new. So you get the frame. And as these cars, uh, this is an urban scene, as cars start moving, 
well you you get to see points coming these are events and the space is a 4d so you have xy time and the gray level so whatever you do I will show you um, I think uh, very close to what brains are doing uh, is that this is what matters is when these events arrive and of course you can always go back to a frame but I'll show why the frame is not always necessary it might be necessary in some cases but it's not so this is an event based sensor uh, put on the car this is a very old result and you see the amount of events generated is between 100 to 700 per 10 milliseconds which is extremely low this is a few VGA and so you see that if you are to create a frame you're gonna lose a lot a lot of the advantages of these cameras because you will have to allocate fixed memory here shown in red this is the amount of data you would need to store a frame at this space and 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 here you see you have few 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 tens of um, events coming and when you look how much that would cost you to put it in an empty frame it's just not worth it another thing that's nice let us start from here this is a hand waving it goes from left to right it stops and then goes the other way around as you can see here when you count the event per time bin just to show you you really are following the dynamics of that hand and and um, and it's quite interesting to see that if you do some frames it's gonna be hard to 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 really um, to really get that dynamics and that memory allocation that would follow the dynamics of the scene so uh, this work is not out yet but you can see here we just tried to see for a, a deep temporal network how much memory is allocated if you had to do it conventional way like allocating every plane or if you are allocating some frames every millisecond and and not not allocating a frame but just keeping the event that you need and you see that on an on if you had if you used a full plane like a full focal plane where you want to store data 8% of it will be really useful on almost every databases we have around in the field 8% 3% on average 1% 1% so that means that if you are to use event based cameras and and try to go back to frames you your frames are going to be full by 8% 3% all of it 90% 99% of it is totally empty so it's it's a huge waste because once you stored your information in such uh, a focal plane is going to take you a lot of delays and latency to really access things and and so again I don't believe uh, frames are the way to go for this type of cameras so just as a reminder frames are around for so long and whatever you do all of us encounter this problem you want to see this picture and this picture has a nice movement but you always by acquiring frame getting information from this background that is useless in red while what you want is in, is to get the beautiful motion of yellow so whatever you do for the slider you will have oversampling and undersampling at the same time the other thing is uh, there is nothing uh, more changing than gray levels and light intensity it's also very slow because you are just acquiring information and throwing it away at the end because I mean you already know what's happening in this corner of the image here and so why would you burn power on just taking it out and and it's also not really solving for what we are looking for in this uh, century which is low power and low latency I mean, uh, you know today's GPUs are still burning a lot and and the high latencies are, are huge because of this waste of uh, resources on redundant information so just why are we doing this it's because unfortunately science is incremental uh, the mother of all cameras is this camera obscura it's a dark room it, uh, and with a hole in it everybody has done this it's a pinhole model and it could have stayed uh, some kind of nice fantasy of history but painters start using it to make paint faster make more money faster and so they would hide into this box and they are the camera they are the pixels and they draw on top of a piece of canvas and over the years this huge box has been shrunk here to a small box you could carry with you for your vacation to put a piece of paper and then replacing you by you know the original film with celluloid and then today with just pixels so 
because you can see the only real um, justification for using frame comes back from our way of showing pictures to somebody but probably not the best for computation so where is the field today we have two sides I would say the historic side of uh, uh, neuromorphic uh, that's advocating like myself for incremental when I say incremental meaning each time you want to compute something, each time there is an event, what you want is to use that single event to add a little bit of computation on what you have been computing before. On the other side, and I've shown by the way why this is nice, because you're, you're really taking advantage of the low uh, data rate, um, all the advantages of event-based camera that I've been talking about in the previous slide. And on the other hand is the field is so into frames that today it's really hard for newcomers to think out of the box and, and say, okay, um, we're doing vision without gray levels and without images, and it's probably, I, I, I honestly understand it's just too much. And so the, there is a, a huge uh, part of the field, which I'm not, this dominant actually these days, is to try to get as close as possible to a frame or to a batch of events and just run very expensive uh, computation. That works well, of course it will work well, but, uh, but each time you, you are generating a frame or keeping a batch of, of uh, events together, you're, you're not gonna be very efficient, let us be honest. And, and just creating a frame by entering events into a GPU to enter a GPU again is, is, is quite far from, from event-driven. So, I've been advocating for this thing, and honestly, I have never seen, but it's not only me, many people have done this, that if you spend sufficient time thinking about the problem in an incremental way, this is here stereo colored, this is a uh, pose knowing the objects, this is a PNP problem, a really hard problem. These are our papers I can show you a link to. And this is um, just detecting faces by not learning a million faces, but just by detecting eye blinks, because you can do it. If you operate event per event, eye blinks are just the best way to show you where a face is in the scene. So, where are we heading to? Today, most of the uh, issues we're facing in computation, I believe, in this type of uh, event-based camera, not DTVS, uh, I mean all of them, uh, except for the newcomers, is what we call the arbiter. The arbiter are causing a uh, lot of trouble for computation. Why? So when you have an array of pixels and they have to decide on their own that they've seen something and signal it, so uh, suppose this pixel sees something, he's gonna send a request to say, hey, I'm a pixel X, Y, like here, one, one, and I think I've seen a change. Uh, can you acknowledge? So you have to ask, uh, send a request on the X axis and then on the Y axis and once both have been acknowledged you go out. So you can imagine this is a, a hack, it's a very time consuming hack, it dates back from 2001, but the effect of it is that you understand that if another pixel at the other end of the array is also wants to signal something, you will have to put the counter and go there and it's going to lose lots of time. So what people don't want to do uh, is do that precisely, and and so these arbiter have the tendency to f to favor pixels who are really close to each other. Meaning, if a pixel came here, you try to say, okay, I'll stay here. I forget about the rest. I'll go later. But for now, I'll try to focus here. There seems to be something, and that scrambles time, and that makes that if you take a bar and you pass it uh, three times in front of your favorite event camera you will see that pixels don't respond in the, in the same order, that some pixels are not responding at all. And, and in an, in a, if you record it from a biological retina, you would probably have better times with some jitter, but just much better. So to go forward, we have to get rid of that. Why? Because uh, if we have perfect times, the computation will become really very easy and very straightforward because uh, what people call noise, which is not really noise. Noise is not an issue in event cameras. It's like salt and pepper or speckle noise. But the real thing is due to this arbiter and to other, f um, to other reasons that are linked to directly to this type of pixel we are using. So the promise of our field is, you know, to go beyond this Moore law. There was this gentleman and called von Neumann that I don't think has anything to do with the bottleneck, but uh, so the idea today is computers, 
you know you spend more uh, time this is a processor this is memory so you spend more time shuffling data around like 80 percent of the energy of your computer is spent on shuffling data around from memory to the processor and back to memory if you bring it to um, uh, our, our everyday analogy is as if you're holding a calculator in New York and your uh, data are in Australia and you have to shuffle data from Australia and New York for every operation you do and brains as far as we know are not don't are not based on such a principle is massively parallel there is no notion of memory separated from computation everything is together and and going here allows us to go away from this flattened curve that is now shrinking uh, processors to the level of single atoms it becomes impossible to shrink them more so the Moore law is, is has come to an end basically and and if we are to use our sensors and really have something massively parallel that can process in this way like the brain then you solve for low power and low latency and we are solving I mean we are a serious contender for our century's uh, challenges, which is IoT, which is this idea that every uh, piece of hardware around you can speak to you, can tell you things, and is smart, etc. If we do that today, it has to be local powered, and it has to be, you know, a local computation. We cannot go everything to the cloud and back. It would be simply impossible. So today. Um, the field is when we think about fine we have good cameras we have good software how do we run it well today the only alternative is to say hey we are copying the brain so we are gonna put neurons in silicon and there have been I mean I'm showing the commercial thread here but I think everybody in the neuromorphic community sooner or later built uh, or some sorts of um, neural chip and hardware and um, FPGA uh, and everybody and the problem there is as I mentioned we are really tied to neuroscience and neuroscience doesn't really have a model that can uh, solve all problems or allow us to do what we are doing as engineers to write equations and 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 you know solve for low latency and the low power we are uh, craving for so today this idea of replicating is is reaching a momentum where you have um, Lohi, which is a wonderful chip, but the cases are very limited. What do you do with neuron par wiring them? You have very few theories that help you do stuff, and it can work, but spikes are very crude and elementary, and uh, at least by uh, artificial spikes. And uh, whatever we do, it's really, really far from uh, the what the brain is doing. So instead of, you know, this has been shown in the past for an airplane, but honestly for uh, lots of other things. Instead of replicating, I guess the best thing is to understand what makes this bird fly, and probably not because it's flapping wings only, but what are the elements around it, and, 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 and build you know, uh, a jumbo jet rather than a flapping bird, although both are <laughs> interesting <laughs> from different perspectives. So uh, I think Terry Sinovsky has a very nice talk, and he shows that there are many ways to approach the brain. What we are missing today is the right level of abstraction for us to get a processor that does the job and, and, and uh, allow the community to, to run its code efficiently and, and think of new ways. So you see, this is interesting. This is the advent of something new. So w what do we, what are the next steps? I think we should and we probably are going to do uh, explore new form of event acquisition this one that everybody is using and copying and is is one of many and there is I've been very harsh on images but I think you know th there is always something in between there must be an, an, a nice way to mix images and events uh, and not just say oh let me transform events into frames or into batches of, of events there must be a link between that notion of an image that we I mean we see images we understand images when we look at them so there must be something else running between events and images that we are not grasping today or not understanding I think the biggest need right now is uh, uh, some sort of processor that allows us to take advantage of all these nice sensors and 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 come up and use them 
to their maximum abilities, which is incremental, low power, low everything, and, and especially low latency. And uh, I think we need to explore better ways of um, taking advantage of their temporal properties. That's where they're really interesting. If, if you use event cameras just as frames, you're using them just as a, um, how do you say, a high dynamic range camera. And finally, as I showed you, most of the neuromorphic community, people do understand uh, neuroscience. I myself uh, record from retinas and have a primate lab. And it's really a way getting interested in neuroscience will not take you away from engineering, but will show you, what can I say, a ground truth, something that people are unveiling about vision, about how the brain works. And so the future of neuromorphic and even cameras is going to come from a hybrid set of engineers that understand neuroscience and probably maybe have recorded from uh, brains and eyes and, and, and really have a deep knowledge of engineering arts and, and fields and, and that's where it's coming. So the future is ours. It's very exciting to, to be here today and to see there is a workshop at CVPR. Uh, I think most of us in the neuromorphic community have been waiting for this for quite a long time to happen. And but it's really uh, tempting to look at the past, but we have a unique chance is to really bring computer vision to some sorts of basic science. And it is feasible because the data you get from events are so close to what real uh, biological retina send you. You can probably not switch from the day to the other, but it's something that is absolutely feasible. Thank you so much.